What's in a name? Several things if we're talking about biological species names. Let's learn what they are. Now let's talk about taxonomy. Yes, that really annoying system where you have to remember like life, and domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. You know, also that thing I've been harping on you for the past couple months. Yeah, I care about this a lot. So taxonomy is simply just how we name biological species. And you might be wondering why I've been harping on this. You've probably heard this quote before. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Um, so this is, of course, Shakespeare. It's a, one of Juliet's monologues in Romeo and Juliet. Um, at this point, um, she is lamenting to her family that it doesn't matter that Romeo's last name is Montague. Um, their love should still be as beautiful. And she is right. Love is love and all that. But that is a different issue here. Now let's talk about this issue of a name and are names important? Juliet is correct that our names have no effect on the natural world. The natural world just is. But names are still important. So let's talk about this why. Names are really for humans. They, of course, do not affect the natural world at all, but they are a way for us to organize what we know. There are some really interesting theories in both linguistics and psychology about how we actually encode these ideas into our heads. If you're interested, look into schema theory. Um, but what, what we want to know here is, um, first, they allow us to organize what we know into concrete concepts in our brain, but they also allow two different people to make sure that we are, in fact, talking about the same thing. And especially when we're talking about science, those details really do matter. These specific definitions allow us to encode um, specific but also complicated meanings. So whenever you're talking about science, make sure you really understand the definitions of these terms because it matters. Um, and what's really especially um, interesting for biological taxonomy especially is we have a system of naming that encodes even more information inside it. It also has important implications. Um, so especially when we're talking about species conservation, taxonomy has a huge impact and how we name species can affect conservation policies. So if you haven't already, I recommend you check out this wonderful paper by Georgina Mays. Um, there's also two really um, important blog posts that I found by Dr. David Hone um, explaining both what taxonomy is, but also why it is important. His blog also is just phenomenal. I highly recommend you check out um, his other posts as well. But let's get back to taxonomy. There are two parts to this. We have first classification and second nomenclature. Classification here, it's just the relationships amongst different species. So we have a lot um, and we have so many, we do want to figure out who is more closely related to whom and make sense of it. Because if we just have, you know, a couple million species, that's a little bit much to tackle. Um, and second, once we know those relationships, now we want to have a standardized system to name them. So let's talk about what we do. Um, this goes back to the Systema Naturae, um, which is the foundation for modern taxonomy. This was uh, put together by Carl von Linné. Um, it was the fad at the time to Latinize your name, so that's why we now call him Linnaeus, um, but that's not actually what his um, original name is. And his system um, is something we still use today because it just works really well. Um, what's kind of funny is he was pre-Darwin. He did all of this pre-Darwin, but just by happenstance, it works so well with how we understand the natural world that we still use it today. And the features of his system are, um, he uses the natural features of organisms to classify them. He uses very consistent naming and also hierarchical groupings. Uh, but let's also just take a quick look at what this book actually was. Um, Linnaeus wrote many different versions um, because this was the age of European exploration. So people are continuing to come back home and bring more and more. So each time he's like, oh, I have to add a lot more to this. This first edition was so cute it, in 1735. It was just 11 pages. Um, and then as he got more and more editions, like this 12th edition here had over 300 pages and was multiple volumes. Um, and you can see on this little uh, screenshot down at the bottom, he is also the one who named the order primates, which of course we are a part of, and he named the genus Homo for intelligence or wisdom. Um, here is a more modern version. The 
Naturally History. Um, this is a Dutch version um, based on the 12th edition, of course, expanded since we've discovered a thing or two since Linnaeus lived in the 1700s. Um, and this is over 8,000 pages. Um, if we were to, you know, um, update this with all the species that have been named since this, I'm sure it would be even longer. Um, though at this point, it's not like even worth putting it in a print, like putting it in electronic format because things are constantly being updated is just better for the environment and easier to make sure that the most um, updated information is disseminated. But let's talk about what this system actually is. So the first thing we wanna talk about is natural features or really the physical characteristics of organisms. Um, and these are what Linnaeus was using to classify different things. So here we have a couple different plants where you can look at. So here are the uh, pistils and anthers and you can see they're just a couple different forms. So there's different numbers, but are they also straight? Are they kind of in the center or are they kind of um, outward in a circle? Are they curved? Um, there are many different ways we can describe these. This is different because previous classifications used um, very different types of uh, ways to classify. So it could be a spiritual hierarchy or the, you know, the the scala naturae that we talked about, how, you know, things that are closer to God or farther away. It could also be utility. Are they medicinal plants? Are they flowering plants? Are they poisonous? Um, or it could also be virtue. Are they good or bad? Um, good is probably, you know, medicinal stuff, pets, things that are cute, livestock. Um, bad things are weeds or poison, probably also mosquitoes. <laughs> The next feature we want to talk about is consistent naming, um, and specifically now we're talking about binomial nomenclature. So we have these two different names. Um, and this is different because before Linnaeus, the previous names were also just super long and descriptive, but also different people would be using different names. And that was not helpful at all. So let's look at an example for this pretty little flower here. So one person called it Rosa Silvestris Inodoro Seo Canina. You can see like everybody's using Latin. It was a thing, um, which means rose in the wild with no scent or dog. I have no idea what the dog refers to, sorry. But someone else um, named the same plant, Rosa Silvestra alba cum rubora, folio glabro. So this is rose, wild, white with red and a smooth leaf. So these are both, you know, descriptions and that is helpful in some ways, but hey, it's just really long. And now different people have different names. So it's unclear, are we actually talking about the same thing or not? So this was really helpful. And first, like Rosa Canina, it's just, it's so much shorter. It's easy to tell that, yes, we are talking about the same thing. And sure, we can still describe this, but the description can be separate from the name. So think of this as your reference. And now that you have the reference, you can go look up the rest of the important information about this species. The last feature we want to talk about that Linnaeus introduced was the idea of hierarchical classification. So we have many groups, but each group is nested in a larger group, and it allows us to relate different things to each other. And also, he's only putting species in a single group. Um, previously, if we we're using these different types of classifications, here's a calendula flower. Um, it, it could be in flowering plants, but it could also be in medicinal plants, and finding things in multiple places just um, confuses it. And then you have, you know, just a longer classification system. Um, but let's look at an example. So here we have um, four different groups that we're going to compare birds, mammals, ferns, and flowering plants. And here, this is not hierarch hierarchical. We have these four groups, but they're not related to each other at all. If we take these four groups again, we can actually add some information here. First, birds and mammals are both animals. So we have a larger group here. Ferns and flowering plants are all plants. And then all of these together are living organisms. So this is how we have a hierarchical group, but now we're able to relate these different groups to each other. And this is exactly what Linnaeus did. Um, so here's the Linnaean hierarchy. At the top, we have the biggest one, all life, um, domains, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So each group, as we go down here, um, it's a smaller and more specific group. So, of course, life contains all species, but species is the most specific level here. Um, and, of course, we, we uh, harp on species a lot because that is the basic unit with which we look at evolution. So that's why it's important to talk about species concepts, know how to properly format these names. Um, but it's helpful to have these larger groupings because we don't want to talk about three million individual species because that's just kind of too much. And sometimes we do want to talk about an entire group and characterize a group of species. And that's why these intermediate levels are also helpful. 
Um, so we can look at an example here. Here is a uh, here is a jaguar. Um, so we're in Kingdom Animalia. Within Animalia, we are in Phylum Chordata. We are in Class Mammalia, Order Carnivora, Family Felidae, Genus Panthera, and then our species is Panthera pardus. Um, whenever we're talking about the species, we do use those two names together. Um, we call that the gen generic epithet and the specific epithet. Um, I don't think it's in incredibly important, but if you care to memorize the order of these, my favorite um, mnemonic here is keeping precious creatures organized for grumpy scientists. And yeah, I'm one of those grumpy scientists. Um, but let's, of course, remind ourselves what binomial nomenclature is created by our friend Linnaeus, and it uses this format. We have our generic epithet and our specific epithet. We italicize both of them, and we capitalize the genus, but not the species name. Um, when you are writing the species name, you do have to write all of this. Um, here are three examples. You may occasionally see things... Um, abbreviated. So whenever in a scientific publication, you do need to write the first name, the full name the first time, but then you might see it abbreviated. So you might see H dot sapiens, um, but you can only do that after you've written out the full name. So let's remind ourselves here about taxonomy. We have these two parts, classification and nomenclature. So classification, that's the hierarchy of those groups we talked about. That's domain, kingdom, phylum, and all of those different ones. Um, and our nomenclature is we have this system of binomial nomenclature. Um, there are many different rules. One of them, all genus names must be unique. There can be no repeats. Um, there's also um, several different systems and um, actually governing organizations. You need to follow their rules before you can officially submit a scientific name. Um, and sometimes there are fights about them, which is kind of cute. So can you explain? What are the features of biological taxonomy?